nós não poderíamos começar da melhor maneira do que ouvindo a comunicação do nosso sócio honorário número 1, um, que nos tem acompanhado desde a conferência que realizámos em 2013. Adolf Ratzke, um velho amigo, com quem aprendi quase tudo o que sei sobre o vida independente, não só pelo que escreveu e pelas conversas que tivemos, mas também pelo exemplo da ativista que ele é. Fundador e presidente do Instituto do, do Independent Living Institute, até há bem pouco tempo. Foi também fundador e membro da direção do STIL, da Stockholm Cooperative for Independent Living, entre 84 e 95. Membro do World Institute of Disability, em Oakland, Califórnia, de 85. E fundador da ANIL, a Rede Europeia para a Vida Independente. E a minha secretária, do Comitê para a Vida Independente da Disabled People of Internet. Vamos então ver o vídeo que o Adolfo nos enviou. Olá, everybody. I'm pleased to be with you again. Last time we met, that was two years ago at the kickoff meeting in Lisbon. Too bad I can't be, be with you in person this time. I just love your beautiful city. Now to our task. On hand. Most people with extensive disabilities who require assistance with the activities of daily living are dependent on their families or live in residential institutions. To improve our situation, to live in a community at conditions equal to our non disabled brothers and sisters friends and neighbors, we need to work for a national personal assistance policy. What does such a policy have to look like? What features must it contain? Should such a policy be based on the results of the present CAVI pilot projects? People who know little about personal assistance assume that our assistance mainly makes sure that we don't freeze, don't starve, don't smell. That may be all we need to survive. But we are not interested in survival. We want to have a life. To have a life means to grow up in our family, play and hang out with the kids of the neighborhood, get an education and develop our mind, work in interesting jobs, contribute to society. Like all humans, we want to make friends, fall in love, start a family. Like all fa humans, we need to feel that we make a difference. We can achieve all this despite our disabilities. We can have rich and full lives with true personal assistance. True personal assistance meets the following conditions. It's the first condition is that we users are in charge of our personal assistance. We are in charge when we recruit, employ, train, schedule and supervise our assistance. The more we can adapt and fine tune our personal assistance solution to our unique person and unique personal circumstances and the better we learn how to use this tool the higher will be the degree of our self-determination and the quality of our life that is the personal in personal assistance yet in the portuguese pilot projects 
users are not in charge. They cannot recruit, employ, train, schedule, and supervise their assistants. Somebody else is doing this. When it comes to training, assistants receive 50 hours of generalized training. Most likely, much of this training consists of telling our assistants the medical implications of different disabilities. What's wrong with us? What we cannot do? And what we should do by ourselves? I don't want somebody else to tell my assistants what they should do for me and how they should do it. Somebody who's never seen me or doesn't know anything about my life, my person, my assisted technology, my family, my work and interests. We are the best experts on our need. If anybody needs training, it is us, the users, because we need to learn how to train and supervise our assistants. We often get to hear that personal assistants may work for persons with physical, but not cognitive or psychosocial impairments. In Sweden, currently 51% of the persons who receive direct payments for personal assistance have autism and similar impairments or acquired brain damage. They might not be able to take all the decisions that employers and supervisors must take, but their direct payments budget contains money for hiring someone for supported decision making. That can be a relative or a former assistant whom the person trusts. In Sweden, a number of assistance provider companies and user cooperatives specialize in clients who need supported decision making. The independent living movement has been developing solutions for supporting decision making sure that we all can benefit from personal assistance. The second condition is the user controls the money flow. We control the money through direct payments, that is, money from the government goes directly to the users who then have the means to recruit, employ, train, schedule, and supervise their assistance. The money must follow the user, not the service provider. In this way, there are no middlemen who pocket a percentage of the government's money and rob us of the control of our services. Here we meet the biggest resistance in countries where disabled people are overprotected and considered unable to make decisions in their own best interest. And service providers will do their best to spread such an image of us, to defend their raison d'etre and to defend their income. In your pilot project, in your pilot projects, assistance users do not control the money. Can they switch easily from one service provider to another if they are not satisfied? Do they make the final decisions about hiring, setting wages, or firing assistance? When we don't manage the money, we cannot be the employer and must accept any service provider that the government selects for us. We will be the object, not the subject. Our assistants will have a different attitude towards us. If you are not the boss, 
if you cannot switch service providers, you cannot enforce good service quality. You have to accept what you get, or made to feel dependent on your assistance. The third condition requires that the direct payments cover the costs of all the hours of assistance we require and enable us to pay our assistance competitive wages. Without decent wages, people working for us will expect our gratitude. Under these circumstances, we cannot count on prompt, competent and reliable work. Without sufficient assistance hours, without sufficient service quality, we will have to rely on family and volunteers. We will have to be dependent, make compromises and concessions. We will have little self-determination. Your pilot projects, assistance users get a maximum of 40 hours a week of assistance. That's fewer than six hours a day. How are people expected to live who need more? For example, I need at least 18 hours a day. How would I manage in Portugal? Obviously, people in my situation must rely on relatives, friends, on volunteers. They would not live, in quote, independently and be included in the community, unquote, as the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities stipulates. My wife and I aspire to the same independence or interdependence from each other that other Swedish couples enjoy. She wants to leave the house, go to work, travel abroad by herself, just as I do. We do travel together when we both want to, or not because I need her to come with me. With the Portuguese pilot projects, my wife would be forced to be my Siamese twin, my lifelong unpaid assistant. That's a terrible strain on the relationship. The fourth condition is that eligible persons must receive personal assistance regardless of age. Personal assistance is listed in the Convention as a human right. Human rights are not restricted to certain ages, but your pilot projects do restrict personal assistance to users older than 16 years. Yet children and their families would benefit tremendously from personal assistance. Parents and siblings would be relieved from being on duty all the time, could get more time for themselves. They could carry on with their lives, continue their jobs and education, go out without having a bad conscience. I met parents of small children with multiple disabilities who were at the brink of psychosis for lack of sleep. They got their life back after their children had personal assistance. For the child with a disability, personal assistance is the way to gradually become more independent from the family. 
just like any other child. With personal assistance, a child can learn to do things by itself, hang out with friends. With personal assistance, a child can take over responsibilities for household chores, go to school. Doing things without mom and dad is essential for personal growth. Naturally, when the child is very young, the parents need to make sure that the assistants apply the parents' pedagogic principles. But as the child grows older, the assistant should be seen not as the prolonged arm of the parents, but as somebody who enables their child to discover and participate in the world around it on its own terms. The fifth condition is that users do not have to share their personal assistance with other users. In institutions, everyone has to share workers with other inmates. That's what all institutions have in common. That's the reason why most of us try to stay away from them. Sharing our assistance turns our homes into mobile institutions and drastically it reduces our self-determination. The CAYEs together employ 570 personal assistants who work for altogether 833 users. There's 570 assistants for 833 users. So quite a few users are forced to share assistance cannot choose who is to help them in the shower, in the toilet, who will open their mail, listen to their phone calls, and witness their family quarrels. This is humiliating. And has nothing to do with, quote, living independently and being included in the community, unquote. In summary, the CAYE pilot project do not meet these five conditions. This is not what the independent living movement and the CRPD mean by personal assistance. Your solution does not comply with the United Nations CRPD Article 19 as defined in general comment number five. Your pilot projects do not give users the means to control and optimize the quality of the services and thus the quality of their lives. It does not give taxpayers the best value for their money. With the same money, a much better system could have been designed. A solution that liberates persons with disabilities from dependence on the family, that empowers them to live with self-determination in the community. This does not come as a surprise. Most CAYEs were formed by organizations for people with specific medical impairments, such as cerebral palsy, neuromuscular, or other impairments. These organizations are typically run by persons without disabilities. For them, disability is a medical issue, not a social and human rights issue. There may be experts on medical interventions and rehabilitation. But how much do they know about what it takes to live independently and being included in the community? 
also a number of the organizations that run these CIA VIEs have been managing residential institutions for decades. What do they know about enabling persons to live in the community? They probably organize their so-called personal assistance services as much as possible in the same way as their institutions. With the same organizational culture, same hierarchical structure, perhaps even with the same staff. Sure, the pilot project might offer a quality of life that may be slightly better than that in our than in residential institutions. But residential institutions are not our criterion of comparison. Our comparison is the quality of life that non-disabled people take for granted. Two years ago, at the kickoff meeting of the project in Lisbon in June 2018, I made the very same points when I define what true personal assistance is about. I'm sorry to say that your pilot projects have nothing to do with true personal assistance. They are fake personal assistance. I do hope the Portuguese future national personal assistance policy will not be based on these pilot projects. Thank you.